talk about what we've been going through. Oh, look at that. You guys might actually get out of here at a good time today. See, this is why we start early, so you can go home at a good time. Let's see if I can preach fast enough for you. Don't worry, I will. I won't preach forever. I'll be quick-ish. So what have we been talking about? The roles of God, the roles of Jesus, and the roles of the Holy Spirit. How we need to be able to see them the way God intended for us to see them. See, the Jews in, in the New Testament had a way of seeing God. We talked about this before. They always saw God as God and Jesus as Lord. They were separate in their, in, in their purposes. They were separate in their identities. The, but they were also one and the same in a way that we probably will never be able to fully understand until we get to heaven. But Jesus is the, ma- we also talked about the fact that Jesus is the manifest word of God. So what does that mean? It means that every word that came out of the mouth of the Father that was spoken, that the, everything about who God was, all, all of his presence, all of his word, everything was spoken into a man, and that man was Jesus. And, and that is how we're supposed to respond to Christ. That's how we're supposed to live. This is why Jesus was perfect. Because it was every word that came out of the mouth of the Father was manifest into a man, into a, actually into a woman, so that she could birth that man, and that man was Jesus. This is why when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's not talking about cannibalism. Why? Because he's the manifestation of the word of God made flesh, which means that when you eat Jesus, what he's saying is eat the word. And when he's talking about the blood, he's talking about consume of the covenant, partake of the covenant with which my blood covered your sins. He's not a cannibal. Okay? We need, that if, if, you've, if you've been in the Catholic Church, you're going to realize that they like to think that it actually turns into fleshy goodness inside your mouth. No. It, 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 it's a garbage theology. It's not true. It's not it doesn't turn into flesh in your, in, your, in, your, in your mouth. It's a reminder. In the same way that Passover was a reminder of what happened. The first time Jesus broke bread and, and, and had that communion with his disciples was at a Passover meal. That Passover meal. Who, who knows the origins of Passover? The origins of Passover started because in Egypt, the people of God required blood. Shed blood on the door so that the so that God's Spirit, God's Spirit, wouldn't kill them. Okay, the, it Literally, the angel of death came down and killed every firstborn in Egypt as the final judgment. And so what did God tell Moses? God told Moses, go and tell all of your people to put blood on the door because if, even though you're my people, even though you're my people, if you don't put blood on the door, that angel will come in and kill the firstborn. And I think it's such a beautiful parallel that, that Jesus decided to talk about communion at the Passover, at the reminder of Passover. Why? Because it's the same principle with Jesus. Even though you may be my people, and he's talking about the Jews, without the blood, without what I did, you will experience the death your sin deserves. This is a powerful thing. Jesus is... Jesus, is the, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you know what? If you look at the Old Testament law, it's a really, really, really beautiful way of figuring out who God is. You want to see what God's about? Go read the Old Testament. All of the laws of God were designed to protect people, to bring about wisdom in people. Did you know that plumbing was, in, was included, or a form of plumbing was part of the Old Testament law? Did you know that how they were supposed to build their houses was part of the Old Testament law? You know why this was? Because they weren't doing it before. People would get sick and die because they would poop just outside their house. And all of a sudden, it would start to infect and create. God gave them wisdom to operate in a way that produced life. You see, God, God, yes, there's lots of judgment in the Old Testament, and we also need to remember that that's part of God's character. God was somebody who still is somebody who will judge the world. I've actually heard a number of pastors, I was at a church once, and they said, well, we can't teach hellfire and brimstone because that just puts fear of God in people. I'm like, okay, what's wrong with this? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
you don't have the fear of God, you don't have any wisdom. If you don't have any wisdom, you can't get to know God. If you can't get to know God, you can't serve God. See how that works? Without wisdom, you can't actually walk in faith because faith is a confident expectation that what God's Word said is real. So if I'm going to believe that Jesus died on the cross, I need to know that Jesus died on the cross. Otherwise, I can't have faith in Him. This is why when you go, when you hear about evangelism being, you know, just go out and get somebody to say the prayer, it doesn't work. There's no faith. There's no word. There's no foundation. You need the word of God to produce in people something of value so that Christ lives inside of you. It says that we're supposed to work out our own our own salvation. It talks about the word of God being grown in us, about that faith being grown in us. If it's an instantaneous thing, why do we need preachers? Scripture says that we're supposed to go out and teach the word because without teaching the word, what's the word? This. If we go out and we don't teach the word, what happens? People don't hear the word. They don't hear the word. They don't respond to the word. How did Jesus say we were supposed to do evangelism? He gives us a really simple, simple way of putting it. He says, a sower sows the word. Why? Because it's only the word that produces fruit. You see, sometimes as Christians, what we've decided to do is look like the world rather than like God. How did we do this? We started calling outreaches when we just feed poor people. We started calling outreaches when we just, when we, oh, you know what? We're just going to give all of these people who are addicted to crack and cocaine and whatever it is. We're just going to, we're going to enable them in their sin by giving them regular food and water and all of this stuff. This is not what scripture talked about. When Jesus said, you clothed the naked, you, you visited me in prison, you did all of these things. Who was he talking about? Because he references that if you did these things, you visited me. Who is Christ on the inside of? Christians. He's talking about taking care of your brothers and sisters. Christ doesn't live in the world. You, he, can't, he can't inhabit a dead, a, a dead vessel. If you aren't born again, if you're not saved, you're dead. You are the, you're the definition of a zombie. I think it's so interesting that today's culture is so fascinated with zombies, and yet the majority of culture is a zombie. You're literally walking around with a live flesh and a dead spirit. And you, you give in to fleshly desires. This is, why we, this is why we have issues in the world. This is why sin produces death. But when we have the presence of God, the Bible says we're made a new creature. And, and even Peter was like, well, wait a minute, God. Am I supposed to go back into my mother's womb and come back out again? And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about your spirit that was once dead and is now alive. This is one of the benefits of Christianity. So what's Jesus saying when he talks about going out and doing these outreaches? He's saying, go and take care of my people. One of you ends up in prison because they made a mistake. Go visit them. If one of you is struggling, take care of them. The benefits of God are for, are for God's people. Here's how I know this. You go back to the Old Testament. The Jews took care of the Jews. Now God did have some ways of taking care of people who were actually poor. If you go back into the Old Testament, again, it's such a beautiful picture of God's heart. What did he do? He said, don't harvest the perimeters of your field or pick up the scraps that fell. Leave that for the people who have nothing. This was important. Leave that for the people who have nothing. Why? Because God was saying they can't get ahead and so leave them something to eat whether they're Jew or not. But what does that mean for today? Let me tell you something. Poverty in Canada doesn't exist. I know some of you are going to be like, how can you say that? Here's, let me explain to you why. There's, there's, uh, here's where poverty comes in. Poverty is, is a result of a lack of opportunity. Okay? True poverty comes because there's no opportunity to get ahead. This is why the Bible had a version of slavery. Because if there was no opportunity to get ahead, oftentimes what were the jobs and occupations back then? You were either in trade, so you were making tents, or maybe you were working with animal skins, or maybe you were a farmer, maybe you were a rancher, whatever it is. But not everybody can be in charge of something. Not back then. So what happened? If you had nothing, it was better that you go and you serve a master. You become a slave. And you know what happened? Is, the, is God put in these rules of how slavery is supposed to work. 
Did you know that most slaves in the Old Testament live better than freedom, free people today? Because if you were a slave, God said, as the, as the master of slaves, you're responsible for their food, you're responsible for their education, you're responsible for making sure that their families are fed, you're responsible for making sure they have a roof over their head, you pay for everything. Because that's stewardship. And you see what happens is we end up with this perspective in North America that we're supposed to go out into, into the world and, and take care of absolutely every single human being. And so what, you know what it's produced is it's produced homeless people by choice who are addicted to drugs and alcohol by choice who are getting more benefits than widows and orphans in the church. And you wonder why people leave the church. You see, poverty is a result of, of missing opportunity. Do you know what happens in Canada? There is no such thing as missing opportunity. You could have both your legs gone and still find a job. That was not the case in Old Testament. They did not have wheelchairs. But today, you can get around. There's handy buses. There's all kinds of things. There's no excuse to not... You might not be living and making $100,000 a year, but let me tell you, if you're making $35,000 a year, you're richer than 90% of this planet. But what have we done? We've taken on the spirit of mammon, which is the love of money, which is the idea that I'm not rich enough. I don't make enough money. I'm not attaining the lifestyle of this person over here. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, God's not blessing me. We blame God because we're not sitting at the top of the food chain. This is a problem. And this is what happens when we get things out of perspective, when we forget who God is, when we forget who Jesus is, when we forget who the Holy Spirit is. You see, what happens when you give to somebody who is addicted to something is you enable them in that addiction, and that isn't godly. That doesn't produce good fruit. Good fruit is not somebody's belly full. Good fruit is they go to heaven. They change. They start adapting. If you want to see real poverty, go to a third world country. Let me explain to you the difference between Canadian poverty and third world country poverty. If you go to a third world country and you teach those poor people to farm, they will go to work. Why were they poor? Lack of opportunity. There's no lack of opportunity in Canada. And therefore, you don't have poverty. You have laziness and addiction, which is a completely different problem. And God can deliver you of those problems, but it's not poverty. A lot of people are going to be really offended by this. This is the truth. This is how God didn't design us to be. His church is not responsible for making sure people stay in sin. It's responsible for confronting sin so that people can come out of sin and let their lifestyles reflect the changes that God required of them. If you teach a poor man how to fish, there's an old proverb. If you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a poor man how to fish, you'll feed him for his life. Here's the problem. You teach a poor man in Canada how to fish, he's still going to go ask you for a fish. You give him a meal, he's still going to ask you for a meal. You teach him how to cook, you teach him how to work, you teach him how to do that, he don't care. He would rather get the handout. That's not poverty. That's laziness. Big difference. We don't, we're not supposed to enable laziness. The Bible says if you're lazy, you don't eat. In other words, if you're going to be lazy, you can starve. That doesn't sound like what Jesus would say. Yes, it is, because Jesus is more interested in you reaching rock bottom and reaching out to the Creator for the answers than he is you being enabled by his people to stay in sin. God designed us to, to, to live and, and act and be a certain way. And the reality of it is, that was a bit of a rabbit trail. The reality of it is, is that God has designed everything you'll ever encounter in this world, in this book. Okay, this book will teach you how to do absolutely everything. It might, actually, it might not teach you how to put a rocket in space, but it'll teach you that God created principles that people can base reality on to get rockets into space. Things like gravity. God created gravity. 
Gravity is a mathematical equation. God created that. We can study to learn about God, but we're not creating like God did. God made everything. And therefore, as the author of creation, he's the one who says this is how you live in creation. So we talked a little bit about uh, Godship belongs to God, Lordship belongs to Jesus. These are not the same thing. God is God, Jesus is Lord. Not the same thing. We need to realize this. Jesus was not all-knowing. God's all-knowing. God said, you know, or Jesus said, only the Father knows the day that I'm going to come. Why is that? If God, if Jesus was all-knowing, he would be privy to that information. But Jesus serves God. God sent Jesus. Jesus, before going onto the cross, said, God, please, I don't want to go through this. And then Jesus, in the middle of that thought, also said, but wait a minute, it's not my will, but your will be done. What was that showing? That was showing Christ's submission to the Father. Why is this important? Because that's how we're supposed to act to Jesus. Not my will, but your will be done. You see, the relationship Christ has with the Father is supposed to be a reflection of our relationship to Jesus. And so you know what happens is, is sometimes we as Christians, we take God out of the picture and we serve this idea of who we think Jesus is. This is an issue because if you take only what you learn about Jesus in Scripture, you don't see Jesus judging anything. Not yet. And so you know what Christians today have done? Well, Jesus didn't judge and therefore I'm not going to judge. Don't forget Jesus is a manifestation of everything God did. And there is Scripture that talks about judging. There's two kinds of judgments in Scripture. The judging we're not supposed to do is the judging we have no authority to do, which is to to stand in authority and say, you're going to make heaven and you're not. We can make observations, but you can't make a judgment call. But you know what we are supposed to judge is fruit. What's fruit? The manifestation of one's lifestyle. The manifestations of one's speech. Because you're out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, what does that mean? It means whatever is in you is going to come out of you, right? Whatever is in you will produce actions out of you. It's not just speaking, it's also acting. If you, who here believes gravity exists? Anybody here believe gravity exists? How do I know this? I believe all of you believe it because none of you try rocking off of buildings. If I were to put you up a thousand stories into the air, I might be a little too high. A hundred and some stories into the air on a plank that was six inches wide, you would be a little nervous because you have a firm belief that gravity is real. Can we say the same thing about God? Can I with absolute certainty and confident expectation say that everything in this scripture is real? That's faith. That's the definition of faith. Is me reacting to God's word in the same way humans react to gravity? I know it's real. Which means that if I'm going to look at Jesus and I'm going to serve Jesus the way I'm supposed to, you're supposed to serve Jesus. Why? Because God said so. Jesus is the head of what? The church. In the same way, God is the head of Christ. We saw that in, I believe it was 1 Corinthians or Ephesians. I can't remember which one it was. We've gone through a lot of scripture. So today we're going to talk about the last, the next part, which is the last point in this, and then we're going to go through the rest of this. If you want to get the context of the entirety of this whole sermon, you're going to have to go watch them on, on YouTube or our Facebook page. But this, the next one is Jesus taught us to pray. Okay, so we have been developing in this North American culture a way of praying that isn't biblical. Anybody here ever prayed to Jesus? Been like, Jesus, please help me. Did you know that there is nothing in Scripture that says we're supposed to pray to him? Not once. Jesus teaches us to pray. Let's go to Matthew 26, 41. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's not the verse that we were talking about, but we're going to go into that real quick. Jesus does teach us to pray. It's actually the next verse, but we'll stop here for a moment. So keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. You know why so many Christians fall? Do you guys know the answer? You know, statistically, 40 million Christians, and this is from John Bevere that I just watched. I really, really enjoyed his sermon. 40 million Christians in the last 20 years have walked away from Jesus. 
40 million. And in case you're wondering, that's almost the entire population of Canada. Gone. Not, not people who don't serve Jesus. People who did and don't anymore. Why does this happen? Well, one, people aren't serving the real God. They're serving an idea of God. And then when the real God confronts their idea of God, they walk away. This is why salesmanship in the church is not good. This is why you don't change gospel to get numbers. You preach the gospel and create conversions. Conversions is not somebody saying a prayer. Conversion is somebody being discipled. It doesn't say go out into all the world and make them say a prayer. It says go out into all of the world and create disciples. Disciples is not a one-time action. It's a lifelong pursuit. The word disciple literally means learner. So what if, what, how different would it be if we started going out and saying, I'm only seeing it as success if I've created somebody who's a learner. I've made someone who's a learner. That's a different success rate. What does that mean? It means that this is the standard, not my ability to sell something. You see, we can make Jesus look real nice because all we got to do is talk about every single one of his benefits without any of the expectations, and now, you've, now you're a car salesman. You can talk about how Jesus heals, how Jesus blesses, how Jesus does the miracles, how Jesus wants to take away everything from you. La, 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 la. And all of those things are good. They're all true, but they're all conditional to expectations that God has of his people. There is not a promise of God in Scripture that isn't conditional to something we have to do. Not one. If you can find one, show me. Every single promise of God is conditional on obedience to Him. So Jesus taught us to pray. So keep watching. You see, sometimes we sit, we sit and we pray, but we pray improperly. Well, Jesus, can you please just get me the car I really want? Well, Jesus, I really, really, really want the job my neighbor has because he has a nicer house than I do. And I want to have that nice house. You see, the problem is we, we, we may even be trying to pray, but are we watching? Are you keeping an eye that you, on, on everything that's happening so that you don't end up in temptation? What is temptation? Temptation is essentially giving something the flesh strongly desires as an opportunity for you to walk into it. A really good example of this is let's say your heart's desire isn't God, it's a big house. Temptation will be a job upgrade that takes you from Jesus. That's temptation. But if you're not able to identify temptation, it's going to be really easy to start walking in a way that you think, here's the thing, North American dream. What is the North American dream? A nice house, a nice car, and a family. At least that's what it used to be. So what happened in the church? We made that our focus rather than God. And so we can justify abandoning the precepts of God, abandoning our families in a, in a pursuit for what we think is godly, which is a house, a family, and a, and a dog or whatever the American dream is. But here's the thing. We need to serve God first and let those things be subject to God. Because if not, you end up with a church that thinks they love God, but really they prefer themselves. They've become their own gods. And, and the Bible talks about in the end days, there will be a, per, a perverse and evil generation and they will be lawless. What does it mean to be lawless? It means that they will not serve God. They're going to make their own laws. They're going to think, well, you know what? It's completely okay for me as a Christian to be a homosexual. This is being taught in churches today and it's hot garbage. It's blasphemy and God's going to, they're going to hell, okay? This is a problem. I'm not saying this so that we puff ourselves up. It's a problem that the majority of the church is going to hell. Let alone the world. Why are they? Because we haven't been watching. Because we haven't been praying. Jesus teaches us how to pray. But what we've done is we've created our own way of praying. And that way is all about me. And so you know what happens is Christians... They start going with these unrealistic expectations of God, and that's not faith. 
unrealistic expectations of God is not faith, it's hope. And it's not the right kind of hope. Because faith is completely rooted in a confident expectation that what God said is going to happen, not what we want is going to happen. If I'm hoping that God's going to make me a millionaire, it doesn't say God's going to make you a millionaire. Therefore, it's a hope, not a faith. God considers you blessed if you've got food to eat, shelter over your head. Those are the two things God says, if you have these, you're blessed. It doesn't even have to be the nicest thing. I don't live in the nicest house. (laughs) But you know what? I'm grateful for my house. I really, really am. We're blessed. But I don't need to be a multi-billionaire to be happy. You know who was the richest man on the planet? To this day, ever, richest man on the planet, King Solomon. What are the two biggest pursuits that men have in today's culture? Sex and money. King Solomon had more of that than any other man in the history of mankind will ever, ever have. They estimate that his value at that point was worth the entirety and then some of the Apple business, of all of Apple. I think they said he was worth around, oh, I, can't, I don't even want to quote the number. It's more than Apple. It's infinitely, it's way more than Apple. One man's worth. So he attained more money than we could ever hope to. He had, was 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had all the sex you could hope for. He had all the money you could hope for. And he looked at it and he said, you know what, life is meaningless. He entered into a depression that was reflective of a lack of God. And, you know, we pursue these things thinking, you know what, if I just get my house, I'll be satisfied. If I just get my spouse, I'll just be satisfied. If I can just get this car, I'll be satisfied. And King Solomon, who had it all, said, no, you won't. I had a billion times more than you, and I'm still not satisfied. So you know what, if you read through Ecclesiastes, the very end of it, what does it say? It says, I've had it all, I've done it all, I've lived it all, but you know what is worth everything is a people that fear and obey God. So keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let me tell you something. The spirit is willing does not mean the spirit is perfect. Because he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about your spirit. Your spirit is willing to receive, but the flesh is weak. What does that mean? It means you need to be feeding this Over and over and over and over and over again, Jesus said, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. What does that mean? You're feeding your flesh. And I think it was Annie who talked about being hungry today. You know how you get hungry spiritually? You eat spiritually. It's not the same as the flesh. If I'm hungry with my flesh and I eat food, I get full. If I'm hungry with my spirit, it means I need to eat more spirit, which means I need to eat more of the Word. What does it mean to eat it? Think on it. Meditate on it. Read it. Study it. Be in the Word. And then let it transform you. Because just reading it does nothing for you. There are a lot of people on this planet who know this Bible in and out, and there's no power of God in them. Why? Because they're reading it and not letting it transform them. They're feeding their flesh rather than their spirit. So we need to be watching. We need to be praying. This is part of prayer. Okay. This is part of who Jesus... This is, this is a command. Mm, my apologies. This is a command we're supposed to have. Now let's go on to Matthew 6, 5 to 8. And we're going to talk about how Jesus taught us to pray. He says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. Anybody here want to be a hypocrite? I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does another. If any part of your life is like that, just change. You're wrong. Change. Get it out of your life. You don't want to be a hypocrite. There are topics in, the, in as a pastor, I will not teach on until I have victory in them. That's been a policy of mine since I was a youth pastor. If you hear me teaching on it, it's because I have victory in this area. Why? Because the last thing I want is to teach something I'm not living, which makes me a hypocrite, which means you can't receive from me properly. 
and I don't want to do that. I'm supposed to represent God, which means that this is how Jesus talked about with, with the plank. We like to read, well, Jesus taught us not to judge. And so you've got, you have to first remove the plank in your own eye before you can remove the speck in your, in your friend's eye. He didn't say don't judge. He said get yourself right first, and then you can remove the speck from your friend's eye. He didn't say don't just remove yours and, and let me do all the work. No, 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 no. He said first deal with you. Make sure that when you're dealing with something, you're clean so you're not a hypocrite. And then you can help somebody through something then there's power and authority in it. Okay? So when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. What's the desire here? The desire is pride. I'm going to pray so that everybody can see me. Look at me be all spiritual. You know how many times people who are new believers come into church and they're intimidated to pray because somebody can pray a fancy prayer? A lot. You know how many prayer meetings I've been to where I listen to a whole room of people pray and there's no power whatsoever because they're all a bunch of arrogant wankers who are only interested in having somebody else hear them pray. I walk out of that room. You should never walk out of a prayer meeting more disturbed than you are encouraged. The Bible says when two or more are gathered together, there I am. If you're experiencing authentic prayer, you'll experience the presence of God. If not, you're going to have a bunch of people sitting there. While you're praying, they're thinking about how they're going to top your prayer. They're thinking about what they can pray about. So that they sound good. So that they sound mature. I've been guilty of this. When I was learning how to pray, I wanted to have the fanciest prayer in the room. So you know what? I prayed for all the big things. God, more souls. Less poverty. More, more, more of you and more miracles. More. I, I prayed for all the big ticket items. And what God's really saying is, is I want you to pray so that my will would be done. And we're going to get to that. He talks about how to pray. Um, truly I say to you that they have the reward in full. If you're praying with, with pride in mind, pride is going to be your reward. You're going to get the feedback of man and that's it. What does that mean? It means that if you prayed with the intent of being seen, what you're going to get is seen and not an answered prayer. See how that works? Because if you're humble and you pray, the reward is the answer to prayer. If you're prideful and you pray, the answer is being seen praying. Which one has more power? The one where God answers your prayer, right? Does God answer everyone's prayer? No. Did you, you, we talked about it last week. Marriage is so important. Husbands treating your wives is so important. Scripture says that if a man doesn't treat her husband, her wife, prop, his wife properly, God won't even hear your prayer. How do I treat my wife? This is, this, this is why this is an important sermon. How do I treat my wife? The same way Christ treats, treats God. I'm supposed to, or sorry, the same way Christ treats us. That's, that's right. How, how are we supposed, how are wives, how are you supposed to treat your husbands? The way Christ treats God. Christ serves the Father. Christ leads the church. Another really good example is how I serve Christ is how my wife is supposed to serve me. The question is, are, are you as a man serving God in such a way that your wife can see the correlation of your servanthood to Christ? Or is she seeing somebody who's power hungry? Because here's the problem. If you're power hungry, your focus is you, not God. We're going to keep reading. Truly I say to you, have the reward in full. Let's go to the next one. But when you pray, okay, Jesus said, I don't want you to pray this way, but when you do, this is how. Go into your inner room. Go, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret 
will reward you. What is he saying? He's saying your prayer should be done in such a way that nobody else sees you pray so that it's authentic. Because when you're alone and it's in secret, you're not actually looking for accolades. You're looking for solely the communion between you and God, the conversation, the bringing forward of who who you are to who God is, and you're making a petition to him saying, God, this is my longing, this is my heart. This is individual prayer, guys. This is how you pray. Don't go on under the streets and pray. Pray in a way that your heart is so passionate about what God laid on it that you're waiting for an answer. And sometimes you'll be that answer. Okay, let's keep going. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. <laughs> this is crazy. They suppose they will be heard. What does that mean? They think they will be heard. What's it implying? They won't be heard. Having lots and lots of words does not guarantee a result in a response from God. God weighs the hearts. The problem with modern day Christianity is there's a lot of people who are far more interested in self growth, in self worship, in having somebody look at them, and having and they're more more worried about pleasing the people in the church than they are about pleasing the Father. And what does it produce? It produces a powerless and perverse generation who are only focused on serving themselves rather than God. If you are going to a church and the pastor refuses to preach on something because it might offend someone, you need to leave that church. Leave. Why? Because that, that pastor, the more people you get, if you have one person in your church with one thing you can't talk about, now, you, now you're missing out on a whole multitude of different things you can do. But if you have 20 people in the church with 20 different things you can't talk about, you know what you're stuck talking about? Grace and blessings. This is the only thing that doesn't offend people. You know, Jesus intentionally taught like this. I have a massive following. Lots of people come up and hear him teach. And then he comes out with a word like, and now you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And half the people leave. He could have explained it. He could have talked about what he did. He didn't explain it publicly. He explained it to who? His disciples. Jesus was culling the followers from the disciples. He was saying, I, I'm not interested in just having people follow me because I'm popular. I'm interested in having people follow me because they want to serve the Father. Jesus was more interested in true discipleship and he proved it in how he spoke. How, how different would the church look if we did that as teachers? If we taught messages that were sometimes difficult with the intent of getting all of the weak people out of the room so that all that was left was the gold. All that was left were people who truly and intimately wanted more of God. You'd have a different church today. You'd have a powerful church today. They wouldn't be great in number, but they'd be great in stature. They wouldn't be able to go out, and, and th there would be so much more power in the church. It takes one person to walk through a hospital when God anoints them with healing, and they can empty a hospital. It doesn't take an army. But you know why we don't see that kind of stuff today? It's because we've fallen more in love with sin. I'm going to steal this from John Bevere. We don't see miracles because we love sin more than we love God. I believe in miracles. I believe all those things are true. But if that's your pursuit, you're in sin. If that's your sole pursuit above God, you're in sin. It's one thing to desire them. It's another thing to pursue them. If you're saying, God, I will substitute who you are. I will put you lower than your works. You've now made works your idol. But works like miracles healings, giftings. And what it'll do is it'll produce a powerless generation. And you know what? Sometimes people get the gifts. They go out and they heal the sick. They, they do all of these things. And I've seen these. I've seen miracles. I've prayed for people and seen miracles. We had, I, I told this story before. We had a lady in our youth group come in with a cast and a broken wrist. We prayed for her. She pulled her cast off and was playing a game called Red Butt with what was a broken wrist which means she was throwing and whipping balls around. I've seen miracles, but here's the thing, is if miracles start to trump character, 
you're going to end up with what Jesus said. You did miracles in my name. You cast out devils. You did all these things, but I didn't know you. Because relationship is only possible through obedience. You can't put miracles above character. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Let's keep going. This is talking still about prayer. So do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask of Him. This is so key. We think that we're pleading to God with something He doesn't know. He's looking down. He doesn't just see your circumstance. He sees your heart. He sees everything. So when we say, well, God, why aren't you answering my prayer? He's like, I already knew you were in trouble. I already knew you were in trouble, but you're not making the changes that I know will produce fruit. I've been telling you the answer. I've been giving you the answer over and over and over and over again, and you're not listening. And for that reason, you're not seeing victory. I once heard a lady, well, the devil gave me a parking ticket. Did you park somewhere you weren't supposed to? Well, yeah, but that's not the devil giving you a parking ticket. That's you parking somewhere you're not supposed to park. And you got a ticket. You can't blame the devil for things in your life that are out that are in disobedience. God always judged his people for their disobedience, and there was a result and a consequence to disobedience. I'll, I'll give you some examples. The, the result of not stewarding your relationship in marriage well is a broken marriage. The result of not stewarding your finances well is financial debt and, and, and pressure. The result of not stewarding your tongue well means you're probably a liar. Cheater, stealer, nobody trusts you. Because there's a way that God said, if you do this my way, there's a physical manifestation and supernatural power that comes with it. Do you know why people trust me more than most people? Because I don't lie. And if I catch myself saying something that's not real, you know what I do? I go back and I say, wait a minute. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I misspoke. I said something I couldn't honor. Whatever it is. But you need to be a man of your word so that nobody can look at you and say you're a liar. The Bible says this. Live in such a way so that they cannot come up to you and cause any offense against you that's legitimate. They can't call you a murderer. They can't call you a liar. They can't call you an adulterer. They can't call you this and this and this and this and this because it doesn't exist. Because you're not that person. It's a beautiful thing. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. If you're talking about faith, this is important. When you pray, when you serve God, know that He knows every single one of your needs before you ever, ever speak them. This is important. Let's keep going. That's it, that's it, okay, yeah. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 7, verses 11 through 18. This is important. This is Old Testament. And we're going to read some things, and I want to, I'm going to tie some things together for you. This is so important. I'm actually going to even go here in my Bible. If you guys have Bibles, I highly recommend uh, using them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that sounded... <laughs> my wife's just over here laughing at me. I do recommend using them, though. I have a lot of Bibles. I don't use them all. All you need to be doing is using one. And all of a sudden, you're going to find that you, get, you, you, you have magnificent success in your life. Proverbs, I've probably read Proverbs over 100 times. Love Proverbs. It's my favorite, one of my favorite books of the Bible. I know, honestly, there's so much truth in Proverbs that's relevant for our walks with God today that if you haven't read Proverbs, you're missing a huge part of walking with God. So where are we going? <laughs> Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, verses 7. 7-11. Yeah. <sighs> I'm going to read here. So Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's palace and successfully completed everything that he had planned on doing in the house of the Lord and in the palace. 
Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send a plague among my people, and my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their land. I'm going to pause there for a moment. The amount of times I've heard Christians say, if I pray, they will heal the land. And they're like, well, God, why aren't you healing the land? Because there's a lot of stuff prefacing the promise of God healing the land. What was it? And my people who are called by my name humble themselves. What does it mean? It means take yourself off the throne and put yourself where God would have you be, which is servanthood to God. Okay? And pray and seek my face and what? Turn from their wicked ways. Do you know why God's not healing this land? Because Christians aren't turning from their wicked ways. They come to church, they look all pretty, they go home and they scream at their wives. Wives, they nag their husbands. I made a post the other day that talks about Proverbs. And Proverbs says this. It says that it's better to be in the middle of a desert and dry land than married to a contentious and irritating woman. This is Proverbs. Okay? Do you know what? The church is full of contentious and irritating women. I have met many, 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 many of them. It's also full of men who are prideful and arrogant and self-serving and controlling and manipulative and they don't serve God. And you know what? If you have a spouse that's one of those two things, it's not justification to look like the world. Jesus' bride does this and he's still faithful. I've sinned. I make mistakes and he's still faithful. Get off your high horse. If you really want to serve God, serve God. Go read about Esther and tell me your life hurts. Well, life is just so sad. I, I just don't feel loved and respected. Go read about Esther. You know what happened with Esther? She, was, she had to prepare herself to be tried out by the king. Tried out sexually. She was one of the many women. Well, the king wanted to see which one he would choose for a wife. So she had to prepare herself and be tried out sexually before the king chose her. She couldn't go into the throne room once she was married without threat of losing her head. So don't tell me that you can't serve God and be in a rough situation. God used her mightily. God did amazing things for her. And God saved her, the people of Israel through a woman who said, you know what, it doesn't matter what my circumstances are because my God is bigger. But I, I, it's, it's all about me. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's worth it. This is important. Verse 14, we're going to keep reading. Uh, verse 15, so now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. This is God talking. So what happens? What shifted for God to be paying attention now to the prayers? People got back into alignment with God's word. See how that works? When you're out of obedience for God, he doesn't hear your cries. But when you're in obedience to God, he starts to listen and respond. 16, for now I have chosen and consecrated this house so that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there always. Who's my? God. God's heart. And for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked. Now, who is he talking to? Solomon. So Solomon, if you walk to me as your, before me as your father David walked. How did King David walk? He, had a, he was considered the only man in Scripture that was, had a heart after God's own heart. Okay? This dude loved God so much that God said, yeah, this guy's after my heart. I don't know about you. But that's something to be jealous about. I'm like, no, no, no. God, I, I'm going to work my butt off so that I can be in competition with King David. I want, I, want, I want to be the one that you say that about. Can you imagine having that heart? King David would be like, I'll fight you for it. And I would lose because King David is fantastic. 
but still I'd try. Here's the thing. He's saying if you walk the way King David walked. How did King David walk? Repentant. Repentant. Fearing God. Honoring God. Loving God's laws and precepts. For if you, or sorry, and as for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, to do according to everything that I have commanded you, and you keep my statuses, statutes, and my ordinances, what am I reading to? 18. Then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with your father David, saying you shall not lack a man to be a ruler in Israel. There's a promise, and that promise is conditional to something obedience this is the same way it is with christianity today god is the same yesterday today and forever when he looked at god when he looked at the israelites in the in the desert he said i will be your god you will be my people if you do these things if you follow the sabbath if you if you if you observe the passover if you follow my commands god always attached a promise to a condition because why God is not looking for people who are all lovey-dovey, feely-weely, and doing what they want. He's coming back for a bride that is holy. He's coming back for a bride that is spotless, without wrinkle. He's coming back for a bride that wholeheartedly says, God, I'm going to serve you. You know one of the most empower- powerful things my wife does for me is serve me. It's, it's so true. One of the most powerful things that she can do is serve me. I, I wake up in the morning, she makes me a tea. I didn't ask her to make me a tea. She made me a tea. She puts it in a little to-go mug, puts it on my cup, and she makes me lunch. And she puts little crackers and notes and things, and she serves me. You know what that does? That is her worship to God by treating me well. When I love my wife, when I bring her flowers, When I make her feel safe, that is my worship to God. Why? Because God said, I'm supposed to steward my wife well. And worship is a result of my obedience to God. So if I treat her properly, I'm worshiping God. If she treats me properly, she's worshiping God. And you know what that does is watch. Watch what happens in the world. When I go in and I treat my wife well, all the people in her office start reacting. She actually had one lady, well, you're just spoiled. And Hannah's like, no, I'm not spoiled, I'm loved. There's a difference. And there is. When you're loved, you're confident to be who you are. Uh Uh-huh, huh See how that works? When you're loved, you're confident to step in. When I'm loved by the Father, I can love the Father because Christ first loved me. When I love the Father, I can step into my absolute blessing. I can step into my absolute obedience. I can step into my absolute best to serve Him. It's because I was loved that He first, it's because He first loved me that I can now love Him. Husbands, you're going to be judged harsher than your wives. Why? Because it's your job to first love. But wives, you'll still be judged. You'll be judged on how you served your husbands. And the, you know what? It, they don't have to even be a Christian for you to serve them. It's the same thing as government. How I'm supposed to serve government is the same way you are supposed to serve your husband. God first, them next. The government doesn't have absolute o- authority over you. When they told us to shut down as a church, we said no. Plain and simple. Why? Because at the end of the day, God's law trumps man's law. It's the same thing with a spouse. If your husband says, I want you to do this, and you say no because it doesn't line up with God's word, you're fine to do that. You are. God will bless you for it. But you need to be serving that husband the way God asked you to. And there's a chance. There's a chance that husband will come to know the Lord, and you'll get credit for it. It's a beautiful picture. God had it. God thought of everything. Is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes. You, this needs to be a motto in your life. Is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes. Is the walk with God easy? No. Is it worth it? Yes. And narrow is the path to salvation, and broad is the path to destruction. What does that mean? It means it's way easier to serve yourself than it is to serve God. This isn't new information, but it is something that we're guilty of today in the church, and we need to stop being okay with it. This is Old Testament teaching. This is what they had as the Bible during Jesus' day. These are the things they taught New Testament kingdom from. When it says they taught the kingdom, you know what they were teaching? 
Old Testament. Jesus didn't, he says this, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. What does that mean? The result of sin changed. Sin didn't change. The result of sin changed. For those who are in Christ, it no longer leads to death. It now you're paid for by the blood of Christ and you can go to heaven. But you, the law still exists. You still have to follow it. It's just now the justification doesn't come from the law. It comes from blood. This is why in Scripture it says, if you keep sinning, or the Bible says if you sin, but the verb there means to keep sinning. There is no longer any grace for you that covers your sin, which means the only thing you can confidently expect at the end is judgment of God. This is why the law still exists. You're just not under it. You're not subject to it. It's not the standard by which you will be judged. Obedience is, is what God's looking for. That's just a basic premise. What's God looking for? He's going to test your works. Jesus talked about this. In the end days, for those who are covered by the blood, he's going to look at it and say, what did you do for my kingdom? Did you treat your family properly? Did you raise a family in a godly way? Did you stand up for righteousness at every opportunity? Can people look at your life and test it and say, hey, did you stand the test of time? What does it mean that God's going to test you? Well, here's the thing. One of the tests that I believe God is going to do is he's going to talk about your words. We're going to be judged for every word that comes out of our mouths. Is the word that you spoke glorifying God or is it glorifying the enemy? You see, if the gospel was as simple as we like to tout it is today, the God wouldn't have put the fivefold ministry in place to teach and train and equip the church. The gospel's not simple. Sorry to say, we tried to make it simple. Nowhere in Scripture does it say it's simple or easy. If it was simple and easy, we wouldn't need teachers and trainers and apostles and prophets and evangelists. We wouldn't need sharpening iron, sharpening iron. We wouldn't need each other to hear from God about how to help other people grow out of their sin. I was having a discussion with Austin, and he was telling me about this, this time where they, they were having some trouble and the church didn't get involved, probably because they didn't want to be offending anybody. Here's the problem with that. If you don't, and you have the authority to deal with something and you don't, you're the problem now. I run a business for a living. If I have employees that are doing infighting, they're the problem. If I don't deal with the employees in fighting, I'm the problem. See how that works? Because authority is commanded to deal with those you're in authority over so that there's order. This is how we're supposed to work. This is how Jesus works. Jesus is the head of the church, guys. He's the one. He's Lord. He can't be Savior if He's not Lord. Every time you see in Scripture, it says Lord and Savior, it's those two together. It's not Lord and separately Savior. It's Lord and together Savior. You cannot have Lord without Savior. And you cannot have Savior without Lord. He needs to be the one that is the final authority in your life. And if Jesus is the Word made flesh, then this is the final authority in your life. If you go home and you imagine up in your head Jesus telling you to do something that doesn't line up with Scripture, that's not Jesus talking to you. It's your flesh. I'm preaching good today. Philippians 4, 6-7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God. Be anxious for nothing. This is a hard one. Can you imagine? Don't be anxious. I'm feeling anxious. Don't be anxious. You know how many times I've heard in church, somebody comes into the church, they go to an elder, they go to the pastor, whatever, and they say, well, I'm just feeling anxious today. You know what their response is? Oh, it's okay. It's okay to feel anxious. You're going through something hard. We'll stand with you and we'll just pray that God makes the problem go away. Ever, anybody ever heard this before? In the church, the, 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 it's okay to stay in your anxiety. What is he saying? Be anxious for nothing. If I want to train someone, I need to say, wait a minute, your anxiety is part of the problem. If you want victory, you have to deal with the problem. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Why is thanksgiving part of this? Because thanksgiving takes the focus off of you and puts it onto God. This is why we teach our children to be thankful because it takes the focus off of them and puts it on someone else. You should be thankful you even got a cookie. What's that doing? It's taking the focus off of me and putting it on, on the greater perspective. That you, not the kids don't get cookies. Be thankful because thankful puts the focus on the giver rather than the one who received the gift. So be, but, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. This is how we're supposed to pray. We have to keep in mind, it's not us, it's Him. It's not us, it's Him. Let's head over to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. And then, babe, I forgot to put the scripture in where Jesus does the Lord's Prayer. Can you find the one in Matthew for me? When I'll, I'll read this part. So rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Who here can say they pray without ceasing? You know what it means to pray without ceasing? It doesn't mean that you never stop praying. It means that you continuously and daily and, and, and every single moment in your day, everything is filtered through the idea of prayer, through, through who God is. So what, what does that mean? It means that, let's say, for example, you're at work. All of a sudden, something goes wrong. You don't know how to deal with it. God, what do I do? God, where would I go? God, how do I deal with this? God, what's your word say about this? And then all of a sudden, this has happened to me. I'm in the middle of something. I've read my Bible. I don't always remember what the Bible says. But in the moment, I'm asking God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? You know what God says? Well, remember what my, my word says. He brings up this scripture, and this scripture is the answer to the problem. And then I deal with it God's way, which is super unconventional, because nobody else does it that way. But because I obeyed God, it produced a result nobody understands. But it's the right result. One of my managers is not saved. A lot of how I operate in the business doesn't make sense to him. But he comes up to me and he says, I don't understand this. This shouldn't work, but it's working. Why? Because God designed the world to work a certain way. And when I operate the way he asks me to operate, it will work out because it's designed to. Let the world persecute you because you speak the truth, not because you live in sin. Uh, let's go through this one more time. I, I love this, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Start at verse 16 again. Sorry. Rejoice always. You notice it doesn't say be happy always. Rejoice always. This isn't like, I got a birthday present, and I'm really excited about my birthday present. This is, I'm in the middle of a struggle, and I'm going, yeah, God is bigger than you. Sometimes you just have to watch Veggie Tales over and over and over again, and when something goes wrong, you just start singing, God is bigger than the boogeyman. And you just keep singing this over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know what's going to happen is you're going to start to believe that everything out there that attacks you, God is bigger than. You might look ridiculous, but if you're really struggling, I don't care where you are, if you're in the mall, start singing, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla or the monsters on TV. Just keep singing it over and over and over again. Because you know what? There are monsters on TV. There's fear attacking you at every given moment. There's Facebook constantly sowing fear while the world could end. There's a conspiracy here. This is happening. That's the monster on TV. How do you deal with it? I'm going to rejoice regardless of what's around me. I'm going to be excited about who God said I am because I'm the change in the world because of Christ in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next one. I'm almost done. Pray without ceasing. Never stop. So number one, rejoice. Number two, pray without ceasing. Always go to God if you've got a problem. Don't go to the world. Don't go to your weird little parenting book. Don't go to anything that isn't of God. Go to the Word of God. Find the answer. Pray it out. Commun Prayer is just communication. 
That's all it is. It's just communication. Pray. Ask God. We're going to look at how to pray in a sec. And then the last one. And in everything. Everybody say everything. And in everything. Does that mean good things and bad things? Yeah. So in everything, give thanks. Give thanks. I had a very, very stressful mid-adult life. I started running crews at 17 years old. I had men look at me and think, what's wrong with you? I've been threatened to be thrown off a roof. I've had a guy come up to me with a knife and say, I'm going to kill the person who cheated on me with my wife. And then he looked at me and said, you're the one who cheated. And ready to, ready to stab me with it. I've had these things happen. And you know what? Those things produced in me because you know what happened in those moments? Is I remembered who God was. And I remembered how I'm supposed to react to these things. I never got thrown off the roof. I never got stabbed. Why? Because the way God works has a different result than the world. If I had said, yeah, try it. I'll throw you off. That's what most people would respond. It would be a fight. Let's brawl. No. God's word came through in a circumstance. And you know what happened is I was able to be like, yeah. Yeah, God won. God moved. In those moments, in those hard things, I was able to rejoice because my God is bigger. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will. This isn't Jeremiah's will. God's will is that you be thankful. When we started prayer this morning, what did we start with? Thanksgiving. This is a bigger deal than we like to think it is. It should be a daily part. Every night before I go to bed, I thank God for as many things as I can think of. You can ask my wife this, because I pray over her every night. And you know what I do is I thank God for all of the. Sometimes I'm just thankful for my pillow, but I'm thankful. Right, babe? I'm not lying to you. This has to become a regular thing, because what does it do? If I start being thankful for my house, I'm no longer thinking about the house I don't have. If I'm thankful for the vehicle I have, I'm no longer thinking about the vehicle I don't have. If I'm thankful for my wife, I'm no longer thinking about the woman down the street. One of the biggest reasons adultery creeps in is because we're no longer thankful for the gift that God gave us. God's will is that all of these things come into play. And we're going to go to the last part of this sermon and then I'm going to wrap it up which is the Lord's Prayer. So pray then in this way. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, and I'm going to go through this step by step real quick. Where does he start? Our Father. Who are we supposed to pray to? Our Father. Who's that? God. We don't pray to Jesus. There's nothing in Scripture that says pray to Jesus. Jesus isn't even interested in you praying for, to Him. Why? He says, I'm the intercessor. What does that mean? When I pray to the Father, He brings my prayer to the Father. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. Look at Jeremiah. He's living, in, he's living righteously. He's doing these things right. And he's praying for his cousin who's going to be saved. And so on and so forth. And Jesus is like, God, can you please move on his behalf? That's Jesus' role. That's intercession. He's ever making intercession on our behalf. That's what Scripture says. We don't pray to the intercessor. We pray to the Father who intercedes for us. And then Jesus intercedes for us. That's the role. Well, Jeremiah, what does that look like? Well, let me give you another example. If my wife wanted something that she could not get, who did she go to? Me. Because there's a good chance I'm going to get it for her. It's not so prevalent in today's day and age, but there are a lot of cultures where women don't have a voice. And so if you are in a culture like that, if you want something, you have to go to your husband who has greater authority than you. Christ has greater authority than you. But God is the one who grants the blessing. God is the one who grants the blessing. He's the one who says yes, He's the one who says no. He's the one who ignores. He's the one who allows. He's the one who blinds. He's the one who makes see. Right? God first. Christ second. And we're going to look at Holy Spirit next week. because It's important to realize who Holy Spirit... Holy Spirit does serve someone. 
I saw that, and, and again, I'm not saying that they have different value. They all have the same value. They all have different roles. My wife and I have the same value, but we have different roles. Everything God designed, he, meant, he, he painted the picture we're supposed to mimic. This is why it's so important to see these things. Okay, our Father who art in hell, hallowed be your name. So we start off with God, our Father in heaven. Yes, hallowed be your name. So we start off with God, you're my focus. Hallowed be your name, worship. We come in with worship. We come in with reverence. We come in with, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're God and I'm not. If we started every prayer with even just these two things, our prayers would look very different. So number one, Father who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be your name is the second part. What's the next one? Your kingdom come. So we God first, and we honor who God is. Next part, kingdom come. God, your kingdom come here. What does that mean? What is the kingdom? This. We're supposed to live this. If we live this, we become kingdom citizens, kingdom ambassadors. You know what the point of an ambassador is? An ambassador is charged with the representation of their home kingdom to another kingdom. If I'm an ambassador of Canada and I live in China, my job on sovereign territory, so the the ambassador of Canada in China has a section of land in China that belongs to Canada, which means that in that area, I follow Canadian law despite being in the middle of China. See how that works? This is how we're supposed to do. I may live, we're in the world, but we're not of it. What does that mean? My citizenship is heavenly, not earthly. What does that mean for us as Christians? It means you should be more focused about living as a Christian than fighting for your rights as a Canadian citizen. Why? Because the priority is different. If you're going to say, well, I'm a Canadian first, you've just identified with something that's not of God. God's not Canadian. He's not. God's God. He owns Canada. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to keep kingdom first. Next one. Your will be done. So we're talking about kingdom coming down, which is our obedience to him. So God, I'm going to live the way you want me to live. Your will be done. Whatever you ask of me is what I'm going to do. Jesus didn't just teach us to pray this. He lived it. He said in the garden, What was he doing? He was teaching the kingdom, kingdom first. He said, I never do anything that the Father hasn't, I never say anything or do anything that the Father hasn't specifically instructed me to do. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He lived it. And then your kingdom come. He taught the kingdom. Your will be done. He died on the cross. He lived this out for us. You get that move of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to say something to your friend. Maybe it's a mom, maybe it's a dad, maybe it's a friend. They say something that's completely garbage and they think it's scripture. You know the truth. What are you supposed to do about it? You're supposed to speak the truth. Your will be done, not mine, not mine. Not my relationships, not my friendships, not any of that. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to live the way we're going to be living in heaven. We're supposed to be living as God created it to be in heaven on earth. This is important. We'll keep going. Give us this day our daily bread. This is the most valuable book you will ever read. I was in a church once and they said, well, Jeremiah, you need to read more books. I said, I only read one book. This is the only book I read. At that point, that was true. I have read other books. I just don't find them nearly as valuable. But I had, a, I had a, a pastor look at me. Well, if you don't read other books, you'll never understand your Bible. I said, huh? If this is all I had, it's enough. How dare you say it's not? It's, well, you, you just never get the right perspective. You'll only, get your, you'll only read out of it what you want to read out of it. No, 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 no. Everything in Scripture can be proven by Scripture. If I read this and I get... So what? Wait, wait a minute. Give us this day our daily bread. Why is it that this, I have to pray for it if I have it. Why do I have to pray for this if I have it? To answer that question, you need to look at Peter. What did Peter, Jesus looked at Peter and said, who is it? He said, who do do they, who does the world, who do the Pharisees, who do they say I am? 
What is, what is what are the response? Well, you're uh, Elijah incarnate. You're Jeremiah. You're la, 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 la. And Jesus looks at them and says, okay, who do you say I am? And Peter says, well, you're the son of God. The Christ. And what is Jesus' response? Yes, praise God. It is my Father in heaven who revealed this to you. This is why we're called Revelation Church. Because not because of the book of Revelation, but because I believe that this book without the revelation knowledge of Christ will be as confusing as reading blueprints is to somebody who's not a carpenter. You'll get to, you you can read blueprints. You can read 55, you can read 25, you can read index you can read those words but you cannot make sense of it without the guy who knows and designed it see how that works without the holy spirit revealing to us daily what this means you can so what do we need to be praying god reveal to me the truth of your knowledge every single day i'm going to read it and i ask that you would reveal it to me let's keep going so far hold on We'll, we'll, we'll stay here. But so far, how much of this is about us? None. So what's Jesus saying? Start off with a heart focus on the Father, and then we'll work on, now we're starting to talk about us, but what are we doing about us? We're not putting requests forward. We're saying, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. You see, sometimes we as Christians like to say, God, forgive me. I made a mistake. And then one of our brothers does something stupid, and we won't forgive them. Don't even bother praying if that's the case. Jesus says, if you don't forgive your brother on earth, I won't forgive you in heaven. Or my father won't forgive you in heaven. This is a real thing. This is heaven and hell. This is the difference. Unforgiveness. If you hold it against somebody who's requested it of you legitimately through repentance and you withhold it, you're in sin. So forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. What does that mean? You're coming clean before the, the presence of God. You're saying, God, forgive me. I screwed up. I made mistakes. Please forgive me of the things that I've done. Why does it say debt? Because the, pro, the wages of sin is death, and you can't work that off. So when you're saying forgive us of our debts, he's talking about forgive me of the sins, the penalty, and the wages of my sins. Forgive me of those things. Let's keep going. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What does that mean? He's asking, God, don't lead me into temptation. Did you know that God allows us to be tempted? He does. Whether or not you're tempted with more than you can handle is dependent on whether or not you're a Christian. Because Scripture says, I will never allow you to be tempted with more than you can handle. So if you're in Christ and you're experiencing temptation, you have the tools you need to get through it through Scripture, through Christ, through Holy Spirit. But if you're not in self, if you're not working with God, if you're not serving God, then you will be tempted with more than you can handle and you'll end up in self-destruction and death. And, and this is why suicide is so big. Everybody likes to say, well, let's work on mental health. You want to work on mental health? Serve God. Without God, you can't have good mental health. You can't. The wages of sin is death. That's a universal truth across every end of this planet. You will always end up in death if you do not serve God. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This does not mean God's going to take away your evil desires. It means he's delivering you from the hand of evil. It means that when you're serving God, Satan hates you. Actually, God, Satan hates you whether you're serving God or not. He just manipulates you if you're serving him. But he will hate you, and he will come after you, and he will attack you. What does it mean? God, protect me from this as I serve you. And you know what? He sets his angels charge over you. That's what that Bible verse is talking about. It's not stopping you from getting parking tickets. It's saying that a supernatural attack on you will be averted if you're serving God. But deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom. Whose kingdom? God. And the power. Whose power? And the glory. Whose glory? Forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way.
This should be the focus of our prayer. This should be the thing we pray about the most often. You know how many times I've had to be, and I'm going to wrap up with this, I've been as a Christian in the middle of a situation that was uncomfortable, and I know, Jeremiah, if, if you tell the truth, when I was first getting through lying, if you tell the truth, you're, you're, it's going to hurt. If you tell the truth, it's going to have consequences. And God's like, well, who do you want to be? And so what do I do? Not my will, your will be done. And so I come clean. And you know what's fabulous about it is there are the consequences. But I receive them with joy because going forward, nobody can say Jeremiah was a liar. In that moment, I went from being a liar to being truthful with consequences. And I would rather have truthful with consequences any day than a liar. Because now God is pleased with me. Well, if I'm doing the right thing, there shouldn't be consequences. Yeah, only in your world. You're in God's world. Sin has consequences. God took King David's firstborn son because of the adultery and murder that David committed. That was the cost of his sin. But God still honored him. God still blessed him. Are there consequences? Yes. Can we still serve him? Yes. We read in uh, Second Chronicles, if you act like your father did, King David sinned. And God's like, well, wait a minute, but if you act like him, why? Because he was repentant. Because his heart was to please the Father. So that was Jesus teaching us to pray. So next week we're going to be talking about how these things influence us. In the, in the culture, how taking God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit out of context can allow us to actually be committing idolatry, which makes us the Lord of our lives rather than God. And we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and His role in our lives. And then once we're done that, we'll have gone through the whole Trinity, and we'll be looking at it. If you have questions, feel free to let me know. But otherwise, let's pray. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your word. Lord God, I just ask that you continue to bless and increase us as we bless and we point everything back to you, Father. I ask for revelation knowledge as we seek and serve you. And Lord God, don't let us be afraid to make mistakes, but rather let us be people who get up when we make mistakes and we repent of them. In Jesus' name, amen.